dollars. And it's efficient if, as I indicated, it maximizes total surplus. And you think about it for a moment. It means that the goods that are being produced and consumed are consumed by those buyers who value them the most highly. Right? And those goods are produced by producers with the lowest cost. The ones up the supply schedule, up the supply curve, who have ha much higher cost, depending on what the market price, the market price is below their cost, they're not producing any goods. Nor should they from the standpoint of efficiency. If you want to maximize the value of scarce resources, you don't want some high co cost producer engaged in using those scarce resources to produce goods at a very high cost if they can be produced by others that have much lower costs. And moreover, once you've gotten to a point where you maximize surplus, changing the quantity moving through the market is only going to detract from that surplus. Let's look at this concretely. Uh, evaluating the market equilibrium. And by the way, it turns out that surplus is maximized at the market equilibrium. And let's see why that is the case. For this particular graphical representation, the equilibrium price is 30. The equilibrium quantity moving through the market is 15,000. And this is the triangle representing consumer surplus, everything below the demand curve and above the price. Okay? And producer surplus is everything above the supply curve up to the price. Okay? Those are the two measures of surplus. Total surplus is the sum of CS and PS. Uh, and the question is, is that market equilibrium of a price of 30 and a quantity moving through the market of 15,000, is that market equilibrium efficient? Uh, let's ask ourselves, who are the buyers who are capturing value in this marketplace? And it's all the buyers who will, whose willingness to pay is above or at $30 per unit. Right? So it's all the people lying along the demand curve from this point all the way down to the price of 30. All of those buyers are benefiting from participating in this market. To different degrees, admittedly, but they're all benefiting. Every buyer that is on the demand schedule below the equilibrium or below $30, they're gaining nothing because they're not entering into a transaction. Now we can proceed and look at the buyers who value the good most highly are the ones who consume it. That's all of these buyers on this portion of the demand curve. They clearly value this good much more than the buyers that are on this portion of the demand schedule. Right? Make sense? Now we can look at the same analysis with regard to sellers in the marketplace. And now all the sellers whose cost is below the market price, market equilibrium price of 30, all of those sellers are capturing some surplus. Once again, to varying degrees, depending on where they sit along this portion of the supply curve. But all sellers whose cost is above $30 are capturing no surplus whatsoever because they're not entering into any transactions in this particular market. And once again, this is an efficient use of our scarce resources because the sellers with the lowest cost produce the good and those with the highest cost, all those sellers along this curve that are above the market equilibrium of $30 have higher cost and they're not engaged in producing this good. Okay? Don't you love the logic? It's just so clean, right? It just makes good common sense. All right. Does the equilibrium maximize total surplus? Let's look at a couple examples. Again, the equilibrium price is 30. The equilibrium quantity moved through the market is 15. What's the cost of producing? Suppose the cost of producing the marginal unit is $35. So let's look at what happens here uh, at a quantity moving through the market, say the marginal seller and marginal buyer, for the 20th, 20th thousand unit. Now, when we stop and think about this, let's see. If we move that quantity through the market, if we were a social planner or a dictator and we said we're going to move 20,000 units through that market, and we ask ourselves, what is the willingness to pay that 20,000 units? It's at this point. What's the willingness to sell or the cost incurred in satisfying this willingness to pay? Does it make any sense? No, it doesn't, because that's a losing proposition. You're producing something that's costing you much more than its value to buyers in the marketplace. So what is the cost of providing that 20th unit? Um, the value to consumers, if we come down to the demand curve, is $20. The cost of capturing that $20, $20 is $35, and thus you're going to lose $15. So what's the right movement here? The right movement is to lower the quantity moving through the market, right? Because now you're not going to lose surplus, because at this particular 20th unit, you're actually you have a negative surplus. It's costing you more than the willingness to pay for that 20th unit. So the natural movement then is back toward the equilibrium, and you will continue to do that until you no longer detract from the total surplus that can be captured in that marketplace. Okay? Um, so we're a little confused. I always thought that when we were talking about price with sellers, it was the price of sellers would sell that. Yes. But are we talking about the cost of producing? Cost, like cost and price yes, they are. No question about it. But what I'm doing is trying to explain to you why the market equilibrium maximizes surplus. So I'm giving you a counterfactual. I'm saying, okay, let's look at what the marginal cost of, say, $35. If you were at that point, what would happen with regard to the value of producing the good at $35 versus the gain to somebody buying that good? Right. Yes, that's what we're starting the process. We're starting the process with, let's suppose that the marginal cost of producing the 20th unit, as that supply curve says it is, the supply curve says it's $35. Okay? And I'm starting there. And I'm asking the question, would we ever be there? And the answer is no. Um, and we're certainly not going to be maximizing surplus. So everything to the right of 15,000 units is going to detract from total surplus. Hence, we want to reduce the quantity moving through the market. Now let's look at the other side of the market. Let's look at a quantity of 10. Now, at a quantity of 10 coming here, at this quantity of 10, coming up to the supply schedule over the vertical axis, that's only $25, right? It's below the $30. Um, and importantly, what is for that marginal unit, what is the willingness to pay on the band curve? It's all the way up here at a price of $40. Right? And as a result, the natural forces within this marketplace will move in the direction of increasing quantity because, because there are gains to be captured. There's surplus to be captured, both on the sell side and on the buy side. Okay? 
Hence, an increase in total surplus will occur by increasing the quantity moving through the market. And you will continue, and you'll only stop when you get to the equilibrium quantity of 15. Okay? And at that particular point, the total surplus, consumer plus producer surplus, will be maximized, and the market equilibrium quantity for a well-functioning market. And we'll define with greater precision as we proceed through the course what a well-functioning market is. For the time being, a well-functioning market is a competitive marketplace where all sellers and buyers are price takers, and there are many of them. Right? Okay. So, um, the market equilibrium quantity ends up uh, maximizing total surplus, and this brings us back to the fundamental insights of Adam Smith. Um, and here I've got a couple quotes uh, in the slides, the student handouts. The one that is frequently quoted is the last sentence. Uh, namely, it's not from the benevolence or the pursuit of public interest by butchers, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard for their own self-interest. And everything we've done up till today, when you look at the supply schedule, as long as the price is above the willingness to sell, it's in your self-interest to produce a good to sell it. Right? And likewise, if you're on the buy side, and your willingness to pay is above the price, it's in your self-interest to enter into a transaction, because you gain from it. All right? A second passage. Every individual does not intend to promote the public interest or knows about how he or she may be promoting it, but in the pursuit of their own self-interest or their own selfishness, he doesn't use the word selfishness, but that's what it turns out to be, uh, they're led by the invisible, invisible hand to promote an end that serves the maximization of efficiency, the maximization of total surplus, which is not part of their intention. They're not, every buyer and seller in the market is not saying, oh my God, I've got to buy or enter into a transaction because I want to maximize the total surplus. I want to maximize the total efficiency. That's not what's going on. Okay, so in conclusion, um, the market... Uh, as we noted with regard to one of the principles that we looked at in the first lecture, is frequently a very good mechanism for allocating society's scarce resources. Uh, and allowing every buyer and every seller to pursue their own self-interest uh, to do so in freedom uh, will end up for well-functioning markets to maximize total surplus. And one of the reasons that central planning, and certainly that existed in China before they moved to a market-based economy, if you look at the Soviet Union with regard to their centralized planning, of course the Soviet Union is no longer around uh, because it came unwound under its own weight because you had central planners. And stop and ask yourself a question. Coming back to Adam's point about, gee whiz, do we have a monetary value for willingness to pay of a particular individual? A central planner, to get to the same result as a market economy, which maximizes total surplus, that central planner would have to know everybody's willingness to pay. And they would have to know everyone's willingness to sell or what their cost was. Right? And moreover, they'd have to know that for every good and service that's produced in the economy. Not likely, right? Not likely. And as a result of not having that information, it turns out that all of those centrally planned societies ended up failing to achieve efficiency or to achieve the maximization of total surplus. And that's the reason most centrally planned economies are well inside their production possibility frontier. Remember our discussion about the production possibility frontier? Um, and as a result, they're certainly not maximizing surplus. So we analyzed welfare economics, giving you the best possible interpretation of markets being an efficient mechanism for organizing economic activities and allocating scarce resources. Um, all of this, and I've said this now three times, and I don't want you to forget it, um, that th these results presume a perfectly competitive market. And when markets are not functioning perfectly, you're not going to get the kind of results that we have outlined here today. Uh, and we'll look, as I've indicated, to instances where the markets fail to allocate resources efficiently. Okay? Thank you.